Hi, my name is Will Pfeiffer, and this is a biomechanical analysis of the American football tackle. More specifically, this will take place from a qualitative perspective. For those of you who don't know what the objective of the football tackle is, is basically to bring down an offensive player uh, who has the ball to prevent them from scoring a touchdown or to uh, further advance the ball down the field. Now, the tackle can come from you know, really any angle, uh, what we're going to analyze here in this analysis is really a head-on collision. Uh, during practice, players will, will practice, you know, side tackling or angle tackling uh, or head-on tackling. But again, for this, per, th this analysis, it will be just a head-on head -on tackle. Before we can get into what a proper form tackle looks like, we have to understand certain biomechanical principles as it relates to uh, the football tackle. And this can help a coach to help their athletes be better tacklers as well if we understand these certain principles. So the first one is inelastic collisions. Uh, most football tackles or collisions are inelastic. Uh, this is when you have two individuals or two objects of different sizes uh, moving at each other in either the same or different speeds. And this can be a really good determining factor uh, for a coach or, or anybody really in measuring if a larger or smaller player can be successful at a tackle based on their size and speed. The other principle is strain energy. Uh, strain energy is basically energy that's stored up in tendons. So the lower uh, the defensive player goes, the more their tendons are stretched stretched. So these stretched tendons then have stored up energy that can be delivered to the opposing player. Also what's interesting as Lay and colleagues point out is that strain energy can also help an athlete be faster. And this is really more I think of a genetic principle but it's still interesting the fact that you know faster players obviously can deliver a bigger blow to their opponent. The last two biomechanical principles I want to talk about as it relates to the football tackle is torque and center of gravity. Now torque is a turn effect a force has on our joints. And really it's the uh, amount of displacement or direction of that object as a result of that force. So in football, it's really our leg muscles that are creating the force that act on our ankle, knee, and hip joints. How this plays out in the tackle is to where if an athlete is too high, meaning that they have a greater degree of angle in their hip, knee, and ankle joints, they have to produce an extreme amount of force in order to produce the same amount of torque to be successful at the tackle. Vice versa, if they're too low and they have a small degree of angle in their ankle, knee, and hip joints, they still have to produce an extreme amount of force in order to produce the same amount of torque. So there really is a happy medium where the athlete should be in, in, in their positioning when they're about to make a tackle that their body doesn't have to produce or, or, or you know produce too much force to, to achieve the same amount of torque. Center of gravity is the area of the body where the individual's weight or mass is proportionally distributed. Now in football, the low man usually wins. So in a football tackle, if the athlete's center of gravity is lower than their opponents, typically that person's going to win. So when the defensive player is about to tackle somebody, ideally their center of gravity wants to be lower than their opponents in order, so, in order for them to be the most stable that they possibly can be. So some keys to a proper tackle, ideally you want to see the athlete with their head up, chest up, and flat back, and this helps prevent head, neck, and spinal injuries. We also want to see the athlete go to about, about or greater than 90 degree bend in the knee. Also the head wants to go to the ball side, and this will help increase the uh, defensive player's chance to force a fumble. As the defensive player hits their opponent, we're teaching them to wrap high, and what this allows the athlete to do is to better help them explode and run through their opponent. Here we see two of my colleagues who are demonstrating what a proper tackle should look like. We have Ed on the left, who's about 6'2 and 178 pounds, and Jason on the right, who's approximately 6 foot, 175 pounds. And as you can see here, he's uh, has a head up, flat back, chest up, nice bend in his knees, explodes, wraps through his opponent, and drives his legs. 
here we have a still shot of Jason, who's on the right, demonstrating a proper, proper form tackle. Uh, if you'll notice, his head's up, his chest is up, and he has a nice flat back, which is ideally what we want to see. His head is also on the side of the ball. Um, in the case of inelastic collisions, which is, a, as I mentioned before, most collisions in football are inelastic, we have Ed running towards Jason. Uh, Ed's about 178 pounds, Jason's about 175 pounds, so both athletes weigh the same. So if we're trying to determine who's going to be more successful, it's really going to come down to speed. So if Jason's running harder in the opposite direction that Ed's running, he should be successful if he demonstrates proper form. When it comes to strain energy, Jason has his legs bent. So if you'll notice, his left knee is bent, left hips bent, left ankles bent, and vice versa on the opposite leg. His tendons are stretched, which then are storing up energy in order to deliver an explosive blow. If he was too high, his tendons wouldn't be stretched that much, and therefore he wouldn't deliver a, an appropriate amount of force. Also, his legs are generating torque, and if you notice the yellow lines, his knee is about 90 degrees, a little bit greater than 90 degrees, which is good. His ankle, almost 90 degrees as well. So his body and his muscles are able to produce an appropriate amount of force, which then generates an appropriate amount of torque in order to be successful during this proper tackling technique. And lastly is center of gravity. If you notice the, the red dots, Jason's red dot is lower, which indicates where his center of gravity probably is. Ed's obviously a lot higher. So what Jason is able to do is maximize his stability by lowering his center of gravity. Ed is obviously way too high, uh, which at the point of contact means Ed's probably going to get knocked off balance and Jason should have a successful tackle. Here we have an example of improper tackling technique. Uh, Jason, who's on the right, is simply tackling way, way too high. And because of this, he really lessens his chances of success, and here's why. Even though this is still an inelastic collision, there are other factors besides size and speed that make Jason unsuccessful because of his poor form. One of them being that he's not maximizing the amount of elastic strain energy. And this is particularly because he's not squatted deep enough. Even though his tendons are still stretched, if he squatted a little bit lower, he'd be able to produce more energy and therefore deliver more force to add at the point of contact. Also, his leg muscles have to produce an extreme amount of force in order to produce the same amount of torque uh, to be successful at this tackle because he is not squatted deep enough as well. And lastly, his center of gravity is higher than Ed's. And this will make him less stable at the point of contact versus Ed, who's squatted a little bit lower, which he will be more stable at the point of contact. So ideally, what we'd like to see is Jason squat a little bit deeper in order for him to maximize uh, the strain energy, the torque, and his center of gravity to his advantage. Here we have another example of an improper tackling technique. And really, the only thing Jason did wrong here is just simply get a little bit too, too low. Did everything right, head up, chest up, back flat, kept his center of gravity low, maximizing the amount of elastic strain energy, but uh, just got a little bit too low, legs got buckled, and the nods always probably won't get run over here in this scenario. If you notice the uh, yellow lines in Jason's leg to indicate the angles in his knee and ankle joint, uh, you'll notice the left leg, left knee is about 90 degrees, which is which is pretty good. Um, it's kind of what we want, like to see a little bit greater than 90 degree bend in the leg. But really what's going on is his back right leg has a sharp, sharp angle, and it's really going to be hard for him to drive off this leg to make a successful tackle. The reason why is because he has to generate a lot of force in his leg muscles in order to produce the appropriate amount of torque that he's going to need to achieve in order to make a successful tackle. Uh, odds are, because of the sharp angle, his body's just not going to be able to produce enough force to, to create that torque. Everything else is really good, though. Uh, heads up, chest up, back flat. He's got a lower center of gravity. He's really maximizing the elastic strain energy in his legs, but because of uh, 
because of him getting too low, he's uh, he has to create a lot of a lot of force and a lot of torque to make a successful tackle. So ideally, what we'd want to see is for him to stand up a little bit taller uh, to really generate that appropriate amount of torque to be successful with his tackle. And that just about wraps it up. I really appreciate you watching. I hope you learned some of the biomechanical principles of what it takes to make an American football tackle.